we go, right on cue. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so if I can request that you keep your cameras and microphones off, that's just to ensure that the technology runs as smoothly as possible. Uh, we may ask you to turn them on at certain points in the day if certain speakers want a bit more interaction. And could you also please confine any questions for the speakers to the chat? Uh, Lowry will be monitoring that. Um, we will have uh, questions for our keynotes immediately after their talk, but otherwise questions for all the speakers are going to be in a Q&A at the end of the day. So just keep putting questions in the chat as we go through uh, and we'll do that all at the end of the day. Our keynotes on both days on today will be closed captioned and after that we'll turn on Zoom's live transcription for those who wish to access it and check the ch chat for further details about that. Um, speakers, abstracts and biographies can be found on our event page, uh, Eventbrite page. And if you have any issues connecting to conference today or any other queries, either send um, myself or Victoria a direct message on here or email conference shcg at gmail.com and we'll do our best to assist you. And then finally, our hashtag for the conference today is shcg. 2021. Um, but I'll now hand over to Lowry to formally welcome you to today's sessions. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, really lovely to see, see you back today. So thank you for joining us yesterday, those of you who did. And I think we had some people who were just doing one day or the other. So welcome to those of you for your first day as well. Um, we had a really great start yesterday, um, hearing from Andrea Hadley Johnson and Simon Brown from the National uh, excuse me, from the Justice Museum and about their approach of curating with, not to, the communities. That was really interesting. Um, we had an interactive session on repatriation from Anna Yulia Yanaza de Rosenda, uh, and then a range of fantastic discussions from a wide range of people and organisations looking at different ethical and practical issues about interpreting and displaying challenging histories. Um, so thank you very much to all of our speakers from yesterday and to everyone who attended. Um, we had some really great thoughtful Q&A questions as well. So that was uh, lovely to see. Um, and although I wasn't able to actually go myself, I hear that the quiz went very well. So I'm pleased that our, social, our conference organizers were very much able to put the social in social history, which is a bit I always think is important. So today we've got another really good lineup as I'm sure you've seen from your programs. So beginning with our keynote from uh, Glenn Hughes and Andrew Hopper telling us about the Civil War Center um, and their partnership working between museum and university. Uh, we're also going to have a chance to look around that museum later with a virtual tour later on this morning. Uh, before that, we've got Norma Gregory speaking about curating miners' heritage, followed by the tour. And then after that, Mamadi Ujuraje and Rian Rousen with a workshop considering histories of Jamaica, which again sounds really interesting. Um, this afternoon, our speakers are again exploring further different elements of working ethically with difficult or challenging histories. So we have Helen Shervin looking at mediating conflict around cultural property, Eleanor Harding speaking about working with volunteers to present difficult histories, and Neville, Neville Stankley considering how we explore these kind of difficult histories consciously and ethically. So a lot, lots to look forward to. But before we get going, um, I want to tell you a little bit about Social History Creators Group, which I'm sure some of you, a lot of you are familiar with. I know a lot of you are members, but I want to remind you of what your membership benefits are. And because this year we've been able to open our conference to non-members, show any of you who are non-members, you know, what, what benefits there could be by joining us. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that it's not just for curators. So, I mean, I'm collections management by training. I'm, you know, not, I don't really see myself as a creator. We really welcome to any other disciplines within the museum sector, and we'd love for more people to get involved with that. SHCG is a subject specialist network and a charitable incorporated organization. Um, and essentially the point of it is to improve the status of and provision for social history in museums. Um, and we do that in various different ways, but a lot of it is around networking and around training. So what does that mean for you? It's essentially we aim to provide our members with a professional support network, access to a community of kind of like-minded professionals, training and advice, inspiration and advocacy. 
and there's various ways that you can do this and you can also access it through a, a variety of different kinds of individual membership but also organizational membership so even if you're not a member your museum your organization might already be so that could be something worth checking out so I know one one benefit that people find particularly useful is our JISC mail list, which is just an email list, but asking for advice, discussions about different issues, lots of object identification, things like that. A really nice way of communicating with people. We have two publications. Our newsletter comes out twice a year. There'll be one fairly soon, so keep an eye out for that. And our journal is published in spring. Um, the next theme for that will be the same theme as this conference. So if you're feeling particularly inspired, the call for papers has been extended to the 10th. So if you're, you know, think you might have a, a good idea for a, a journal article, please do contact our editor. We also have loads of resources online, um, various videos, um, uh, object loan boxes, which are actually physical boxes that can be sent to your organisation to help with training around different kinds of materials. And the first base site is a really big one. So a huge, a big database of links and references on a wide range of different topics to help you in your work. SHCD also campaigns on your behalf, advocates for social history um, and, you know, and museums that look at it. And that can be in any number of ways. But if there's any issues that you think we should be looking at that you don't think we are, then do get in touch with us. So this could be, you know, just, uh, governmental policies or councils considering trusting museums they're all things that we've been involved with in the past kind of anything like that do do let us know and then the other you know big benefit is our training events obviously the conference is one of them so you are here so that's great um, and we also have seminars on different topics um, so keep, yeah keep an eye out for those um, and sort of on that note, obviously we're online for conference, which is not usual for us. We're hoping to be in person next year and to resume general in-person activity from January. Although I do really want us to keep, kind of keep on with the hybrid approach because it just means that that many more of you are able to access what we're doing. And, you know, that is you know, something that we should be aiming for very much so. Um, but our, next seminar should be coming up um, and it will actually be digital although it will be in January but that will be on demystifying first phase so if you've ever used the social history and industrial classification system or if you just want to know more about how to use this database of resources to help you in your work or you know if you might want to do a little bit of personal development by contributing to the database then make sure you join that to find out more It'll also be a chance to talk to a lot of the first base committee and members of uh, the SHCG committee too. Um, I think that's plenty for me to be honest. Uh, if you want to find out any more about either how to contact us or about membership benefits or look at any of those resources I've mentioned, there'll be some links in the chat for you to do that. But I think we should now get on with the rest of the talks. So over to Emma. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, so as Larry uh, mentioned, we're going to kick off our day with our keynote, uh, and this is centering on the National Civil War Centre, which was originally one of the venues for this uh, conference when it was going to be in person in the before times, as we like to refer to them. So I'd like to welcome today our keynote speakers, Glyn Hughes from the National Civil War Centre um, and Professor Andrew Hopper, a historian of British Civil Wars currently teaching at Oxford. And they'll be speaking about partnership and collaborative working between museums and universities and how they've worked together to present and interpret challenging histories. So I'll hand over to you, Glyn and Andy. Thank you. Um, Andy, do you want to share the slides? OK. Can people see them OK? Yeah. Lovely. Uh, well, thank you for inviting us. Um, I, I suppose um, uh, if we introduce ourselves, um, my name is Glenn Hughes. I'm the team leader, Exhibitions and Collections, National Civil War Centre and Newark Museum, which gets a prize for the longest job title uh, imaginable. Uh, and I've worked here for um, about 33 years, all told, doing many roles, pretty much every museum role. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Hopper. Um, I uh, worked at the University of Leicester in the Centre for English Local History for the past 15 years. Um, uh, but I've just moved jobs. Um, and so I'm now in the Department for Continuing Education um, at the University of Oxford. Uh, and my collaboration with Glyn goes back to about 2012, I think. Um, so we've, we've worked together now for, for quite a long time. So our, our first slide um, is um, we, we, what we plan to do over the next 40 minutes or so is to, um, first of all, give you um, a, a bit of background on the timeline of our collaboration and how we've worked together and what kind of activities we've, we've been involved with. We'll try to keep that bit brief and then we'll start to look and think about some of the questions um, we were asked to address about the, the value of that collaboration. Um, so I think I should probably ask Glyn to start off with how the collaboration began, I think back in 2012, with the HLF application. Yeah, um, it, uh, we had two museums in, in Newark and um, um, the higher ups decided that uh, we didn't need them. Um, and um, subsequently we put in a HLF bid, we put it in several times and on the, the last occasion they decided that they would include the heritage staff, um, which is always a good idea if you apply to the HLF, um, to apply for money. Uh, and we were successful. Um, which was great and um, we were looking at kind of Newark's USP which was the Civil War really when it came to prominence. However having got the money we, we kind of realised that we had a distinct lack of skills within the museum team to actually explore the Civil War. Um, we also had a, a lack of objects. We had some coin hoards, some swords, some breastplates but it wasn't enough to be a nationally set national center, which is what the politicians and museum staff wanted. Um, as part of the HLF process, we set up various consultative boards, one of them being um, an academic uh, board, which was vital really, because they were able to advise us on what was an incredibly complex period and to get to the real kind of core stories and the core kind of things that we needed to tell. Uh, I remember a teacher saying to me, just to uh, uh, go back on that, that uh, when we said we got the money for the National Civil War Centre, they said, um, we don't teach Civil War because we'd rather teach Ireland or Origins of the First World War because it's easier which it raised a kind of an exclamation mark above my head of how complex and how difficult this was going to be. So we put out a call to academics. I think Andy was the first kind of, I, I hesitate to use the word conscripted, but um, I think he volunteered. And um, we were really gratified in how uh, accepting and how willing they were to give their time. And um, we organised meetings and pretty much the uh, academics sort of started to shape the interpretation and where we were heading. And they were able to conjure stories that were really interesting um, right from the offset that took it beyond kind of uh, your standard military museum in a sense. And I know Andy right uh, put in a, a Wolfson application um, and mm -hmm. subsequently I think that came to the National Civil War Centre and we partnered up with it and that paid for pretty much the room I'm sat in as we as we speak the um, we got £64,000 and established uh, the library which was one of the core remits of the HLF and it kind of gave us confidence and we opened up the museum uh, in 2015 um, after a struggle, but um, as part of that, um, with one eye on going for national accreditation, Andy had organised uh, an inaugural um, mortality conference. And um, it was incredibly well subscribed. 
uh, lots of people came and it was a, a different way of looking at the civil war and a way of putting people back together as opposed to destroying them. And I think it kind of gave us the impetus to look in a different direction. And, and um, because it was so popular, I think I said to Andy, do you fancy doing an exhibition on welfare and care um, during the civil wars? And um, fortunately he said, yes. And, and that sort of started um, the real kind of, or continued the partnership as it were, and we put together the Battle Scarred exhibition. I think you came up with the name Battle Scarred, Glyn, if I recall correctly. I, I think I did. It was one of those, <laughs> one of those, one of those moments um, I have. Probably too much caffeine or red wine, one or the other. Well, you see, academics have these long-winded titles like mortality care and military welfare, which don't really appeal to a popular audience. So we were, we were very grateful to you for that. I think one of the values of the conference and then the exhibition was it was able to, I think we're sort of reiterating Glyn's point, was one of the criticisms of the museum when it first opened was that it was too locally focused and it was about Newark's experience of the civil wars. But by taking this theme of the human costs of civil war, it was able to, you know, it, it enabled the centre to recast its um, focus as a, as a national one um, at a time when in the historiography of the civil wars this is an increasingly fashionable field uh, quite a number of early career historians making their name in this field and so um, those often often those are the kinds of historians who are um, eager to make a mark uh, beyond academia eager to um, spread the uh, you know, public engagement with their research um, and, and who are you know, eager to build these kinds of collaborations. So we had a um, we had numerous meetings of um, an exhibition committee. We set up a committee involving museum experts, educational experts uh, and academic historians as well. And we had quite a few meetings of that committee over the six months between uh, autumn 2015 and when the um, exhibition opened in March 2016. Um, and uh, there was quite a lot of joint and uh, careful planning went into, into all of that. And it, that was a great experience for the academics involved because they've not, I don't think any of them, well, one or two had, but most of them um, hadn't been involved with uh, planning a museum exhibition before. So that was launched in, in March um, and that was followed up by a grant from the University of Leicester to have a kind of hard copy legacy of the exhibition by producing these 24 page A4 brochures with captions and illustrations of materials from the exhibition so that um, these could be freely given to visitors at the museum and distributed at events and, and things so that people would have something to take away after, they, after their experience of seeing the exhibition. And they also paid for two um, postgraduate interns from the Centre for Museum Studies at Leicester to do some visitor evaluation experience um, for, you know, to, to get a feel for how the visitors engaged with and interpreted the exhibition, which I think was a, a kind of a new thing for for Newark Museum to do to to to, to um, that, so there were questionnaires and there were um, Holly and, and and Lily were in the galleries interacting with visitors to to find out what their views were on things, and so all this built up into um, a, a, a a good collaboration, and that enabled us to have the National Civil War Centre as our public engagement partner when we put in for a large grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to research the petitions by maimed soldiers and war widows and orphans of the civil wars who you know, were attempting to claim pensions. The first kind of state pensions were claimed in this period. Um, and we wanted a digitization project to photograph them all and to transcribe them and map them 
And, and you can look at that now. It's a free website. You can just Google Civil War Petitions to find it. But our, our main point for this really is that I don't think that academic research would have been as possible or, or, or the, the application would have been less powerful if we had not had a strong public engagement impact plan, which is where the museum came in. And we were able to show that this hadn't come out of nowhere and we'd not just conjured it up for the application, that this is, this is a, it was a collaboration of several years standing um, already by this point. Um, and I think that really helped with the application. Um, and then we were able to begin to leverage funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Midlands Three Cities um, doctoral training program to fund internships for PhD students to work in, to the, in the museum to do particular jobs. So the first one was um, a, a history PhD student, Stuart Beale, working on augmenting the main database behind, behind the, the, the siege database in the main museum gallery to um, put more primary source material onto it, to research pictures and to research um, the details of the sieges. Andy, can I just say, are you moving the slides on? Yeah, can you see them? No. Can you see the next slide? Is it the world turned upside down slide now or is it paused? Um, I can't actually follow can't it, see, unfortunately. Can't, no. You can't see the slides? We, we can, Andy, we can just see you're about to go into slideshow mode and we can see sort of the whole of PowerPoint with the slides down the left side and you're on timeline of collaborative outcomes currently, so slide two. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll have another go at sharing it then. Um, it was fine initially and then it just went halfway through. Okay. Um, how about that? Is that working? Perfect, thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, okay, so the, 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 um, the collaboration continued um, with um, Battle Scarred being quite a successful exhibition. It was in, originally envisaged for six months, but it ran for, for nearly three years or just over three years. Um, and it won a, a, a runner up award for um, the from the East Midlands Heritage Awards um, and the un, and, and, and the museum were able to obtain national accreditation in part at least in part as a result um, and then the petitions project were, were hosting their events at the museum too and we've had events with teachers school teachers who uh, have been informing us what they would like to see on our education website what materials they would like to use in class that we can help provide from our um, from, from our petitions project and it was very nice to be able to host that at the museum because it's a much more attractive venue for them to come and, and, uh, and see us at than a boring university seminar room um, and then we were able to collaborate on a second exhibition too. The world turned upside down and we were able to get more funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to fund a, a PhD student intern to write the next um, brochure. So we were copying really the, 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 what we'd done with Battlescarred um, and we had another visitor experience evaluation um, by another very talented um, University of Leicester museum studies intern Flora Ma um, and, um, a, a, and a super free exhibition brochure to go with that for the world turned upside down and that's still in situ that's still there it was launched by Earl Spencer in September 2019. Um, bringing us up to date um, we were able to publish the conference papers from the Battle Scarred conference that we'd had when the museum opened with Manchester University Press. Uh, we were able to get more money from the Arts and Humanities Research Council for a four year studentship for um, a student to be rather than just having a brief internship for three months to actually be embedded in the museum for her whole four years and to work towards um, Work to, to, to work towards putting on an exhibition on civil wars in Ireland, which is our big ambition 
for 2023 because that's not been accomplished yet in the UK and of course is a very difficult and, uh, and delicate uh, topic to handle. And then Leicester University appointed Glyn as an honorary fellow at the university um, last, the last summer, which means that he can um, has access to all the same resources that um, students and, and academics have. So he can access all kinds of um, normally sort of pay to view materials um, that uh, are only available within universities. Um, and then most importantly, from my boss's perspective, um, we were able to submit a impact case study for the research excellence framework in 2021, based on the partnership with the National Civil War Centre. Um, uh, that's why the university was taking this so seriously is because of the, this is how universities obtain funding from central governments for their activities. They have to demonstrate their impact beyond academia with impact case studies. And this was a, a very good one for them to use and it was submitted for the history department um, for, for the history for history's entry and you know a successful case study is worth the same as eight academic monographs so that's how much they're weighted at the moment which is which is enormous and so it's very useful for academics to be involved with these because there's a lot at stake with them and, and it shows that their research is important and, and matters okay um so now we're coming to now, now that's the summary over now we come to our questions um that we were asked to, to, to think about um and our, our approach to presenting objects to audiences was to look for human interest stories people from all different social groups and backgrounds and genders and ages and here's just a few examples of some that came um some that we featured in the battle scarred exhibition um, on the left there, you can see Lady Brooke, whose portrait is in Warwick Castle. It's a portrait of her in mourning attire. So it's a very good example of um, you know, how the self-fashioning of widows during their mourning um, after their husbands have been killed in the wars. Um, and then the central one is, is from a surgical treatise written by her surgeon at Warwick Castle, who served there during the civil wars. And one of my PhD students had been working on that and, uh, and suggested we use that in the exhibition, The Marrow of Surgery, a kind of a medical manual, which showed something of the advances in medical practice that took place during the civil wars. And then the final object there was, was one that came into the museum. So Glyn ought to talk us through that last one, really. Um, yeah, it's my former boss, Michael Constantine, I think, on his, on his travels around the county, um, came across um, this piece of armour in a private collection, and negotiated um, with the owner to, to loan it to us. Um, it's particularly significant. It has a, a musket ball hole near to the neck rim, um, which is the, the fatal um, fatal musket that killed him, musket ball that killed him, really. Um, and um, it highlights the other thing, which is with the Civil War, I'd never come across it with other museums, was that where items were stored and where items were located, you could do checks of museum collections and you could find certain things, but for some reason, the Civil War objects seem to be in private homes um, and some in museum collections, and they were hard to locate. Um, we kind of decided that we wanted to go towards this area of almost exploring social history, looking at the Civil War as a social history uh, area, area rather than a, uh, a military, because that way people could I identify with it and they could um, get on board with the story and the complex stories that, that we were trying to tell really. Um, in that though, there is, there is a, as I alluded to before, there's a distinct lack of knowledge within the museum team for it. Whereas if you have a, a group of, of 
academics who are exploring Lady Brooke or exploring sieges or exploring um, the way cannonballs can uh, shear off bone and that sort of thing, then you have this network that you can just tap into and alight into and say, have you got anything on that I can use to tell this story? And what that does is it, it cuts down on your research time, which means it frees you up to look at other areas and to explore other areas. And it also adds to your CPD and your confidence in that respect. Um, it, is, it is a complex period, as I said. Um, we realized that we would, we would cover the, the kind of the overarching individuals, the Fairfaxes, Cromwells, Charles, Rupert, it would be remiss not to, you can't do it. But actually, the more interesting thing is to look at the members of the public and look at their stories and tell it as a, as a human story and as a, as a nation story, which actually impacts on the world we're in today. Um, and the academics opened a large window into that. Um, it was phenomenal. Not only did um, Andy know where the portrait of Lady Brooke was, he had all the background information about her, which allowed me to put together a label really quickly in a, in a text panel and to explore the painting and the setting context really easily. And also provided an in to the curator over where it was. So it, it was pretty much an easy job for me. Um, we also used, with, with our time, um, we also used um, the academics to put together, I guess the, the most innovative thing we did was an augmented reality app, which was, I'm not sure if it was bringing the museum to the town or taking the town to the museum, but it was a way of people walking around the town with the app and downloading it and, and having little historical vignettes when they were in certain locations and those events happened near that location. So we're lucky in the, that quite a lot of the 17th century buildings survive. Um, and it was, that was quite a, an innovative um, way of putting the museum out in the community and bringing the community back into the museum perhaps. Um, it's phenomenally expensive, so there are, there are caveats attached to that. Um, and we also looked at uh, sort of virtual online tours. Um, academics, again, advised with that and were able to help the LNP to look at um, learning materials um, and uh, putting together podcasts and being talking heads. And you, you kind of know straight away that they are authoritative they know their information so basically it's it's easy in a sense and and therefore it doesn't take too much time um ultimately we'll be doing well during lockdown there was the academics helped us with the learning from home which was a boon to us really because it kept the profile of the museum without within the broader community and it allowed some of our politicians to kind of say, well, the museum is still doing something. And, and we wouldn't have been able to do that um, because we wouldn't have had the staff. We, half of us were furloughed. It was, it was tricky at the best of times. We'll be looking at uh, a star objects trail. I know Andy's already done a, a talking head um, regarding a, a 3D kind of world that the learning and participation are working on, which is kind of beyond me, but I'm a crusty old curator. Um, and we're also looking at the academics providers with articles. So as part of our national remit, we have to produce articles, booklets um, that lead debate in this particular area. And if you have a, a team of academics that are doing in-depth research, you simply tap into them and say, what have you got on, I don't know, Quakers in the 17th century living in uh, rural areas. Um, and generally they will provide you with something and they provide you with something really, really quickly, um, which is a real boon 
uh, to us. Um, and then, uh, again, it was by Andy's contacts, really. Um, we put together a battle scarred film, which was perhaps, Randy, you can talk about that and oh. about the petitions and that human story. Yeah, I mean, this was something we wanted to do to um, get over the petitions project to a wider audience. Uh, we got some money from the Economic and Social Research Council because petitions were oral performances as well as documents. They would have been recited at the quarter sessions courts and it would have been decided on the basis of that how um, deserving their claim was. And so with all of the RSC's actors um, on furlough um, during the first lockdown, this was the perfect time to get them to um, take part in um, uh, dramatizing these petitions, which they could safely do from home by videoing their own performances. We, these were skillfully weaved together by one of the assistant directors of the RSC and one of the actors who was very good with um, tech and social media and stuff um, and uh, made into a, a, a half hour long film after which we had a open forum of discussion um, you can see that um, on the civil war petitions website um, and this was something that quite a few museum professionals attended as well as teachers and academics and um, veterans organizations and military charities so this has a very strong this subject has a very strong resonance for as well, um, uh, you know, people interested in, in disability in the modern age too, and disability historians as well. And so the bat that we call that battle scarred, and the name keeps on giving because this summer we've got a, a, a summer school planned at Oxford for a, a week long summer school at Merton College, uh, looking at the project um, in depth with, our, with the whole team will be there, and, and we're hoping that that will be a, a successful week including a, a trip to the National Civil War Centre in midweek to spice things up a bit for them. So they're not just sitting listening to, to, to lectures and presentations all the time. So now it's really over to Glyn to talk about what, um, what, what, what academics were, were able to bring to the museum. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned a little bit already, um, but um, we, the academics have brought an element of CPD. I, I was asking the team about this and um, the way academics can impart complex information in a, um, in a way that is understandable, it's what they do um, when they teach um, to museum staff. Uh, with little or no knowledge in, the, in particular areas is um, brilliant and it gives you confidence in the subject that you're talking about uh, and to go forward and to do lectures. Um, it, it was challenging in some respects but it was and that was around sort of scheduling and, and things like that but, but it was um, very much um, it was a partnership, and I guess all partnerships work on the basis that uh, the part, what, what the respective partners give. I think that we would have struggled to move from a local government museum to a nationally styled museum, and it was something that politically they really wanted. Um, and academics gave us the impetus they gave us a kudos to within the community it's okay if i say about uh, lord fairfax but if andy says it says it then it's far more it has more relevance and more um significance um we also had a, a remit to produce uh, catalogues and books as part of the nationally style publications and obviously the Battle Scarred book and the free guides, which we did for the exhibitions were key to that and was a, a great level of providing another, another level of interpretation, which was free and that was, that was great. Um, and it was something which was picked up on when the assessors, the ACE accreditation assessors were here, they were kind of 
astonished that A, we were giving them out free. We couldn't have done that if it wasn't with the, the money that we've got from um, the academic circles. Um, they were high quality. Um, so they uh, reflected us in a, a really positive light, um, high quality images, high quality text. Of course, the other thing was that we didn't have to, we did a little bit of editorial work but we didn't have to do an awful lot of research. Um, the academics could do that uh, and we're perfectly placed to do it. Um, and as, as a museum professional, having access to the academic world, attending conferences, getting papers, staying up to date with the, the latest thinking on I don't know, 17th century bone sores, um, it's important to us and it enlivens the job and it maintains our interest and it kind of makes sure that we don't fall behind on our understanding of, of that and can talk with some confidence about it. Um, so the access to academic networks and the, the meeting other in sector individuals and I was always, we're all busy, it's always tricky and I, I was always astonished by the level of support that the academics, maybe I'm just a cynic, but um, the level of support that academics gave and the, the willingness to support us when they are busy and we are busy. And it was like, um, it was a shot in the arm in a sense. It gave you a, a level of confidence for working in the sector and for what you were doing. And also looking at the objects which you always looked at in a new light um, and telling stories about them. So it was, really inspiring. Um, we okay, so we also should... had, uh, sorry, Andy, what were you going to say? Sorry, Glenn, I was just looking at the time. I was just oh, looking. sorry, yeah, I'm waffling on. Um, <laughs> um, I'll, we'll leave it there and we'll move on to the next one. Is that all right? I'll be, I'll be quick That's with fine. this. I'll be quick with this slide. I mean, from an academic perspective, um, it, 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 this offers, you, historians the chance to access audiences beyond academia. It's really important to demonstrate that now in funding applications for research grants to be able to show you have pathways to impact. Um, you know, it's a massively important for our big grant application. I'm not sure if the Civil War Petitions Project would have happened without that. Um, and then of course we got to learn new skills as well by devising um, text panels for the exhibition. Um, and you know, using words, vocab that will uh, appeal to, you know, that can be understood by a wider audience and dispensing with jargon and writing succinctly. So it's useful um, new skills for academics to gain for having the discipline to write very brief, short, succinct, crisp um, uh, panels for, for an exhibition. Um, and being able to handle the objects as well. Um, I mean, material culture is becoming such an important part of, of a historian's work nowadays. Um, it, we were able to offer, we are widening the skill set of our postgraduates and our PhD students, um, and you know, attract funding from doctoral training partnerships like the Midlands Four Cities. Um, and we were able to benefit also from the um, education team at the museum. The learning and participation officers, um, Sarah and Denise, who um, always look over anything that we're preparing for schools and, 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 and say, no, don't put that in, change it, and make that bit more understandable. And I mean, that's, that's a really helpful, effective um, resource that we can call on too. Um, and you know, it has been very important in the emergence of, of our, the education resources on our project website. So challenges, um, we, I think Glenn's alluded to some of these already. Of course, it's time. Um, my time's now much more squeezed than it was. Um, getting the time to write the funding applications is, is very difficult. Um, but being on the same page, I suppose, being clear about what we expect from each other, clear about what we're hoping to achieve long term, and I think importantly, maintaining regular contact as well and trying to maintain regular prompt contact when we contact each other to always try and get back to each other as soon as we can. But that's we've built that up over, over nearly 10 years now. Um, 
Anything to add to that, Lynn? Um, I think it is kind of that aligning of, of, of common goals, really. I think it's astonishing that we've, it was revelatory to me that it, we'd been partners for nearly 10 years. Um, that was, that seems to have flown by. It's a bit worrying, really. Um, and um, we, we do come from different worlds, but at the same time, we, we can help each other. And I think that's phenomenal, really. Um, okay. No, I think that that's, that's about it. Okay, um, so how do we communicate with a period of history that's less well known? It, Glyn's already alluded to how complicated the civil wars were, how fluid um, the coalitions on either side were, especially when we bring in Scotland and Ireland, it's very, very difficult to um, understand all the, all the changing, the rapidly changing events. Um, uh, and, you know, the big question, how should we remember the English Revolution? Um, and, you know, what are the consequences and legacies for today? How do we compare this time with more recent civil war or more, more recent wars? Two things really stand out for me. One is the scale of the human loss in the civil wars. I think that's far greater than most people imagine. As a proportion of the population, it's greater in both world wars combined. And I think that shocks people and it's a hook, it grabs their attention um, about you know, how catastrophic the civil wars were. Um, and also I think it's really important for us post-Brexit to understand the civil wars better because this was the time when the relationships between the English, Welsh, Scots and Irish were really forged in the mid 17th century. And that a better understanding uh, of that conflict to have better relations between those four peoples moving forward um, is really important with the prospect of the UK possibly breaking up in the next few years. And this is where we've come to, this is how we've landed on the plans for our next exhibition for summer 23. Um, and that's the, the idea of presenting an exhibition on the civil wars in Ireland. Um, the Embattled Isles is going to be our, our strap line for it. Um, and you know, why, well, why, it's, why those wars have such uh, a legacy today. Um, and this was written as an application to the Arts and Humanities Research Council for a four year studentship to be embedded in the museum to help prepare and plan this. Um, and these are some of the challenges we're going to face with this. They, uh, there's a lot of entrenched feeling on all sides about interpreting the civil wars in Ireland. Uh, we're going to want to um, collaborate with academics in the north and south of Ireland and museums in both, and to try to search for common ground. Um, it's very difficult to avoid oversimplification, oversimplification because the civil wars in Ireland are even more complicated than the civil wars in England were. Um, but um, we, 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 we're trying to develop partnerships with academics in Ireland and museum professionals in Ireland in order to do so. And I think acknowledging multiple and valuing multiple perspectives in that exhibition is going to be really important. I don't know, do you have anything to, to add to that, Glyn? Yeah, I think that this is the exhibition which, um, which comes and visits me in the mid wee small hours, um, late at night. Um, it's it's going to be a challenge. Um, it's going to be a challenge because politically, locally, we've already had some issues dealing with, um, with Ireland. Um, but to just to, to kind of a say about, you know, we, we were saying about the civil war in Ireland, and of course, if you say to Irish um, academics, the civil war in Ireland is 1916, and I can't recall the Chesterton quote, Andy, I think you, you probably can, the, the English always forget. And the Irish. Yeah, well, G.K. Chesterton said that the great tragedy is that um, in England, the civil wars in Ireland are always forgotten, but in Ireland um, they, they can't be forgotten. You know, that's the it's it's, it's along the lines of that, isn't it? It's the yeah. you know, one in England, no one seems to know or care, but in Ireland, it's it's all they can think about. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and I, th I think that's going to be the, the challenge for us. And um, looking at some of the objects which we are hopefully going to loan, um, they are going to be they're going to be tricky to display and uh, contextualise. But um, you know, we, we need to do that. We need to shape the debate and, and kind of go forward with it. And I think uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's it's going to be um, I think it'll be exciting and it'll be great to do. Um, We're hoping to have a conference to open the exhibition with, with, with academics from Ireland involved. It was really interesting to get the higher diplomatic support really, really quickly for that exhibition when we, when we, when we put it out there, which was phenomenal, really. Um, and we've looked to, I mean, many, in many ways, the, ex, the inspiration for this, as it was also the inspiration for the Civil War Petitions Project, was the 1641 Depositions uh, project at Trinity College Dublin, which was a similar project to digitize and transcribe all of the petition, all of the depositions made by fleeing Protestant settlers attempting to escape the massacres from 1641. Um, that's now uh, 10 years ago, that was all made, made as, a, as a website, which was made, the whole project was made possible by the peace process in Northern Ireland. Um, which, it, you know, the, the academic work on that wouldn't have been possible without that. And um, at the launch of that project at Trinity College Dublin, um, Ian Paisley and, and Mary McAleese both gave um, very good speeches and, and shook hands. And there was, you know, there was, there was hope for the future. There was hope for collaboration and a better understanding of one another. And of course, that's an absolute dream for um, an impact case study. They don't have to have those in Ireland, but uh, had that been within the UK, something like that would have been an absolute dream uh, uh, of an impact case study for, for, for a university. Um, and then now really, we just need to conclude, Glyn, and, and um, th these, these are some of the key points we hope we've managed to get across in the last 40 minutes or so. Um, it's really important, increasingly important nowadays for academics to work with museums. As that, that's my main, my main perspective, really. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not doing it just because I've been ordered to and because that's where the funding is. I, I, I'm doing it because I, I think it's worth doing and that there's value to it. And, you know, it's much more gratifying to be able to reach out to a wider audience than just a handful of academics. Yeah. And I would I would say that um, it's really interesting the amount of it, it was challenging filling in the first impact case studies and, and contributing to it. But in a sense, when we when you start to look at it as basically evaluation, um, it became easier to do. And from a museum perspective, you you kind of it challenged what you were doing and why you were doing it, and that's always a good thing. And we were we weren't particularly good at that. Um, it wasn't inbuilt into our work program, so it kind of came in via a back door in a sense, and we, we kind of adopted it. Um, we, we needed to forge links with the academic community. Um, we, we absolutely needed them in terms of knowledge exchange and, and the knowledge that they can provide. Um, they, they were kind of invaluable to us, really. They sourced objects, they changed the interpretation and how we were going to go at it. And um, they provided us with the tools which we could confidently or fairly confidently go for a nationally, uh, nationally styled accreditation. Um, and um, the next steps, because Andy's, Andy's got contacts over in America, is to look at a couple of colleges um, over in America to internationalize uh, the remit and to look at perhaps international conferences. Um, and I should stress this, you know, we, there's no way we could have done this before. It's, um, it provides, academics have always provided us a level of additionality, which we just didn't have. Uh, and uh, um, it's been tremendous really, um, and heartening. And, um, it's improved our CPD. Uh, when I've asked um, sector, you know, my professional team here, they were always glowing in their uh, feedback on the academics. And that's, that's great, really. 
Thanks, both of you. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, and move on to questions really quickly, just so that we're not running out of time before we get anywhere. Um, but thank you for that really interesting insight into collaborative working between academics and museums. And I'll hand over to Lowry um, for some questions. Hey, thank you both. Um, so we've had a couple. So what, first one from Verity Smith is for you, Glyn. Um, Sarah Keeling talked yesterday about being provocative in a local authority museum. What's the one piece of advice you would give about persuading senior staff, politicians, stakeholders, whoever, to give the green light on a controversial or sensitive project? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I should have known that would come from Verity. Yeah. She, said she has information, insider information on this. Um, I, I think... Um, I'm, I think getting on board um, higher level um, politicos and politicians um, is, is always useful and uh, it's something I found um, to my cost uh, that um, if you don't they will kibosh things pretty quickly and they may say to you that they want a challenging museum um, that forge a debate but actually when you do that sometimes they don't like it because the debate goes in a direction they don't they don't want it to go so my advice is to try to take it's either to try to take people with you or or basically don't say anything at all and hope that they don't notice but I, you know i don't think that's that's uh, valued that last bit maybe mobilizing um friendly contacts as well that share your um you know that share your aims and goals for the exhibition yeah. Um, we, we, we're on very good terms with a senior academic at Trinity College Dublin, who is incredibly well connected. Yeah. And um, we can go to her for advice on, on, on who to approach and, and who to get involved at, at, at very high levels. And that, that helps a lot. I think if we, if we uh, mobilise Lord uh, Earl Spencer, uh, who's one of our patrons, that, that would carry some weight, I think. Um, so... Yeah, you're right, Andy. Get 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 a kind of a, a, an unstoppable force going, so they can't stop you. <laughs> well, keeping them informed, keep, making sure they know what's happening, and, and, and keeping them on board is is really important. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so it's I think it's been really interesting hearing about obviously your guys' really successful partnership, and it sounds like you know one of the ways that has been so successful is all the contacts that you do have, but. Do you maybe have any advice for people here on developing academic partnerships, perhaps people who haven't done it before or who have tried it in the past and found it quite challenging? Hmm, I think I think a lot I think a lot rests on building up a relationship over time. I, I don't think it can be achieved quickly. Um, it, it's getting it getting it. I suppose it's going back to that slide on. Um, on where was it the the, the slide on um, challenges to successful collaboration? Um, it's um, it, it's not something that sort of emerges quickly or can be rushed. I think uh, it builds up over time, um, and you know you <laughs> having a good personal relationship with, with, with I think is really important too, isn't it? Um, and mutual trust and and so on, um, and they go back, it often takes time to build. Do you have anything to add, Glenn? Yeah, I, I think it's it's the same with, with our kind of our learning and participation department and schools. If you can find the, the individual that's willing to go the extra um, nine yards to, to develop and keep things going, that, that's really the key, but, but it's not easy and it does take some persistence um, in the first first instance it, it's um like any partnership it requires nurturing and, and kind of um people putting in to, to it it's, it's not easy but it but it is worthwhile i i think within academia um you might be advised to target uh, if you're uh, you target early career academics um who um, perhaps less ground down by the system and have a, a spark and enthusiasm still in them um, who want to reach out and, and importantly you know asking them at an early stage 
could this be an impact case study for your university? Because if that starts to be entertained by the management, then they are prepared to throw resources at it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, that brings us slightly over 11. So I think we'll have to call that to a stop there. But thank you very much, both of you. That was really great to hear. And um, over to Emma. Thanks, Larry. And if anyone does think of any more questions for Glyn and Andrew throughout the day, do pop them in the chat. Uh, and if you're able to stay to the end of the day, both will have another Q&A. Otherwise, I'm sure we can pass questions on. Um, so next up, we have Norma Gregory, who is a historian and curator specialising in African Caribbean diasporic experiences. And today, Norma is going to be sharing her journey of researching and curating the Digging Deep, the Coal Miners of African Caribbean Heritage Exhibition at the National Coal Mining Museum. So Norma, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen with you. Okay, thank you. Hope everyone can see the slides. And good morning, everyone as well. Um, as a passionate museum curator, writer and broadcaster of multicultural social industrial history, it's my pleasure to share with you today experience of my professional journey tackling the challenges, realities and successes of locating, collating, exploring and interpreting the memories and culture of coal miners of African Caribbean heritage that is curating black miners heritage for inclusion within existing and new mining museums for public awareness and education, as well as for the for sector professional development in terms of adhering to the Equality Act 2010 and the global equality, diversity and inclusion agenda. This paper discusses some of the challenges and successes of my work and shares possibilities and hopes for the future. Through this reflective presentation today, I intend to offer a sense of hope, inspiration and resilience for in industrial heritage curatorial practitioners and a sense of resistance and strength to tackle traditional blinkered narratives around workforce and the recognition of the cultural makeup of UK workforces in general, but to move towards being inclusive heritage interpretation practitioners professionals that are open to change when change is needed, to be inclusive to new knowledge when new knowledge arises, and to celebrate new partnerships, as, as mentioned by Glenn um, and Andrew previously, uh, when partners bring new vision, new voices, and fresh horizons to make society a better place for all. As diverse curator curatorial practitioners of history, by working towards revisions in current museum interpretations, accommodating underrepresented heritage from the multicultural communities in which we all serve, and embracing the warm winds of change through a lens of social justice and the mission of equality, diversity and inclusion, much can be achieved in terms of true accessible education for all. This paper aims to shine a light on some of the challenges and successes of interpreting black miners heritage in relation to traditional mining narratives presented within UK mining museum context. My case study relates to the Digging Deep Black Miners Museum project, originally supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Midlands and East and partners, and we are truly grateful for their support over the years, which um, has, um, which was a heritage project that originally started in the community and by the community in 2010 and reaching new heights in the last few years, particularly the last couple of years. Even um, though heritage lottery funding has fin technically finished, the project still continues to document, preserve and educate the public about the existence, experiences and contribution of black miners within the cultural landscape of British social and industrial history. So I want to discuss now some of the challenges and barriers. Until recently, very little was known or documented about black British miners. Resistant and, re, res, resistant and resilient frontline workers who experienced life 
underground and on the surface as coal miners in UK coal fields, predominantly since the 19th century until 2015 with the closure of the last mine in um, uh, Kellingham, in Yorkshire. The sacrifices and contributions made by black miners and indeed all miners is truly significant and I believe in warrant of formal acknowledgement and recognition, which I still pursue today. The Digging Deep Touring Exhibition has been on tour since 2018 with previous residencies at the National Coal Mining Museum for England, Wakefield, Yorkshire, who've been a, a true partner, a helpful partner over the years. The Pontypridd Heritage Centre in Wales, Preston History Group, New Art, the New Art Exchange Nottingham, Billsthorpe Mining Museum Nottinghamshire, and the Woodhall Mining Museum in Northumberland. These have been some of the places where the exhibition has toured at. The exhibition is currently being hosted at the Common Room of the Great North, formerly the Mining Institute in Newcastle, uh, UK, with the valuable support from the CEO, that's Liz Mayers, Emily Tent, and the team at the Common Rooms. So a big thank you to them. Um, and this exhibition is being hosted until the uh, till November the 1st, 2021. So please go and see it if you can. I would like to share a list of some of the challenges experienced on my journey curating Black Miners Heritage over 11 years to give a picture of some of the initial barriers and the types of barriers. And then I will explore the many successes and outcomes achieved by curating and sharing Black Mining Heritage. So, so first of all, I've got to say, you know, being a black woman, <laughs> looking at this topic, uh, a black woman from Nottinghamshire. So uh, if you're familiar with mining heritage, uh, Nottinghamshire does have a very strong story in uh, the history of British mining, obviously involving the strike as well. Um, working in a predominantly white male context, um, but feeling, you know, th they could be the, at the beginning, there's feeling of difference. Um, but now, obviously, over many years and, and good relationships formed um, and better understanding, um, there's a strong, you know, strong positive relationships formed and being accepted. Um, but I do believe in making my presence felt and also standing firm. Um, another challenge at the beginning was um, not being seen as a threat, but a but as a professional friend, speaking directly to, to a lot of white British miners uh, who I think saw me as a bit of a, uh, saw me as perhaps as, as a bit of trouble, but, um, um, and perhaps discolouring history in some way. Um, but I, I view it as, um, you know, it's, it's a shared, a shared multicultural global history that, that is rich and, and needed to be shared and um, contributed to over the years. Um, another challenge was the resurfacing of the, the memories of the strike and non-strikers. Non um, I've mentioned this before. Um, many of the miners we've interviewed, I've, I've interviewed personally of 70 black miners um, and many non, non uh, many white miners and miners from different um, in Indian miners, Pakistani miners as well. Um, and the memory of the strike, um, bringing that up again, uh, which is a you know very sensitive topic even now in 2021, even though the strike was in 1984 and 85, it still is a, a kind of contentious uh, topic around industrial history. Um, and an, really, it was a kind of civil war at the time um, against the miners um, and, and, and the government. So bringing up that topic again, but you know, there was a reason why we had to talk about that um, during this research, because it is part of uh, the national story of, of mining. Um, another challenge was initiating the research, getting it started and actually believing in, in, in the work and believing uh, the importance of the work, pacing myself, pacing the volunteers and the staff that we had working with us and not getting distracted by uh, new histories and new projects. There's many new things to, to work on, but we, we kind of really, I made sure that we kind of focused on this topic and did a good job for, um, for the future. Um, the public, um, the public have been a massive 
part in this uh, research. And we've had to contact many libraries, many archives. We've had uh, obviously building our websites and I've uh, added the links in the chat, um, building the websites over the years so that the public can contact us and share their stories. Um, we've looked at, uh, we've done a lot of work with um, the media as well. Um, using get, getting the media on board which i'll just discuss in a moment because i think i've just jumped ahead in some of my in my talk but yeah establishing a database with the um a lot of the data that was coming forward um through through uh through the public public engagement particularly like doing talks like this and conferences and media, media work so um so some of the successes now um Successes have been, you know, being able to find the miners. Um, this picture here is one of uh, the two mining reunions that we, we were able to do to get the miners together. Um, the people have been core of this research. Um, the miners themselves, their stories, their voices, and just getting them together to get this photograph was crucial for our for our kind of well-being and mental health, but also for theirs as well, because they hadn't been asked about their history before. And they said to me when I was interviewing them, all of them said, you know, you're the first person who's ever asked me about my experience as a miner we, and I thank you for that and and this picture here just kind of celebrated um their journey and their kind of um how far they'd come to you know to be sitting there that day to get the picture together you know to get this get this picture so the oral histories have been crucial to finding out about this history collecting them collecting the oral histories transcribing them archiving them using them in our, in our exhibitions and on our website to in order to educate Making professional friends, um, linking them up with existing mining museums um, has been core to our, our work um, and central. And again, it's a big thank you to all the museums and all the practitioners we've met along the way um, that have helped us and guided us um, with this research and embraced it as well. Um, we've got to uh, thank uh, the public, obviously I've mentioned the public as well, who've been <laughs> superb in, in bringing forward stories. So, so the future now, the legacy of this, um, of curating black mining heritage, we've been able to um, obviously work, like I said, work with the National Coal Mining Museum, um, and they have a beautiful um, memorial garden, memorial sculpture um, in the, in the, in the, on the grounds of the, um, the museum. And we've been able to contribute a disc um, celebrating the life of the black miners, adding to, adding to the memorial. Which has been, which was a fantastic day when that happened a, a couple of years ago now, um, and television, the media. I mean, as I, as I'm director of Black, uh, sorry, the Black Miners Museum, um, which is part of the Nottingham New Centre um, company, social enterprise. Um, we work, we work a lot with the media in order to get our message across. Um, we, the core thing that we've done is create new content. There wasn't any, there was very little content around black miners history before we started looking at this and trying to you know, preserve it. Preserving it is through the media. We've been able to make programs like this one here called the Welsh Black Miners. We were on board from the beginning with this program, helping the research, bringing in the, act, the, the, the um, contributors, the miners that appear in this program. I think it's just gone offline now. It's been on BBC iPlayer for a whole 12 months. Um, and it's the 5th of October, that was it. The 5th of October, it's literally off this week and I hope it comes back on. Um, because it's been fantastic. Um, we've had lots of really lovely uh, comments from the public from all over the world commenting on the programme saying that they didn't know about this topic. How come they didn't know about it? So that's been core. Um, we've been able to obviously do our, create our YouTube channel. We've been able to create um, media, uh, sorry, BBC radio programmes and other podcasts. All of the media that we've created um, curated and created is on our website blackholeminers.com if you go to the menu media and we've got them all there for the public to to access um 
sharing artifacts. We've been able to um, work with schools, as mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, work with libraries and archivists, looking at what they've got and sharing it, taking it to students, lecturing at, at the university, um, getting people, uh, young people, scholars, students, lecturers to, to look at it and look at why um, diverse history is, um, haven't been represented in, in universities, in schools, and, and making a change, doing something about it. Um, that's been core of the work that we, we've been doing. Um, working with young people here on the top right, we've got uh, young people doing a, a collage of the of a canary bird, which is part of mining history. They used to help the miners, um, uh, they used to detect poisonous gases, and they were they just, they were making, we got the young people to do a collage. Um, and obviously the touring exhibition, we've done many uh, community engagement uh, events. Um, I want to just play you a few minutes of um, some of the miners interview here. I'll just play, I haven't got a lot of time, but I would like you to just hopefully hear some of their voices. Uh, yeah, whether we can- Interesting. Um, it was um, ex exciting, um, frustrating. You can, you can name quite a few, really. Yeah, and overall, I enjoyed it. It's a good, a lot of miners will say it's a good camaraderie and, the best, and uh, people can. You can't explain to a person outside of mining about mining unless you've worked yeah. down the pit. So it doesn't matter where you come from, I suppose, in the world, all miners can actually relate to each other. Yeah. So that's a good thing. So, can you remember some of your friends, miners, friends that you came with them? I can, I can remember some of them. Some of these kind of fade away as the years go on, um, some pass away. But yeah, I mean, quite a few of them I can remember. The team um, that we always, we trained together. Um, we went through the process of yellow hat, red hat, and then some of them dropped out. And then some remained. I still remember those guys, a few of those guys as well. Um, some of them, we had a reunion recently, and um, <laughs> you bump into people. It, obviously, the years changes people. So I said, oh, can you remember, can you remember me? And I'm going, oh, you're trying your best to try and remember, but sometimes you, you can't, so. Okay, so that is just some of the oral history, which if you see this central picture here of our exhibition panels, we have QR codes, which we created about five years ago now, but you know, obviously QR code is the rage now, but you can actually listen to the uh, many of the uh, interviews that are embedded in the, the panels that we have uh, on display. Um, more of the legacy of this um, history, we've been able to make a stained glass window uh, pictured here on the right, which is again in Newcastle on display at the moment, and do curators walks and talks. Um, and uh, bringing in the miners themselves into the history um, and creating lots of obviously newspaper articles and uh, media. And um, the central picture in the bottom is a sculpture of a, of a William Rose, a miner, um, and that's on display in the centre of Doncaster in a big stone monument there now. So much has been achieved. This is the High Commissioner uh, of Jamaica who came to visit the exhibition and uh, since shared this story with the CARICOM, which is, which is the Caribbean um, the Caribbean uh, Islands uh, Union, that he shared this history with them. These are some of the books we've been able to now create through this history. And we've not just create, sorry, we've also been included in some of these publications, um, which again, was not in existence until we, we looked at this topic and poetry as well. Um, so I'm just aware of, of time. Um, Finally, this was a documentary film that we've been able to screen in Doncaster. This was screened in October 2020, and we entered it into several international film festivals, and we won two, and we're shortlisted in one, um, which was amazing achievement. So um, if you want to see anything about that, please obviously visit our um, YouTube channel, channel and the links here. Um, my current work now is working as a diverse heritage consultant, working with museums, helping them directly to look at their collections and how they can diversify it and, and to, and to uh, bring new audiences in to museums. So that's some of the work that I'm doing now based off this, this work. And um, this is some of the work that is in progress and to be done 
now and in the future um, and one is obviously to continue the exhibition touring that and we've got bookings for next year to create more schools resources we've been able to create lesson plans for teachers which are on our website um, can continue uh, and develop the international work that we're doing. We're working with the Department for International Trade, um, looking at how we can export our knowledge here about diversifying collections, because we do have a very strong, and we can be world, world leaders in this field um, of diversifying collections. And I think it's something that we can think about exporting for the future and uh, completing the book. So they're just some of the things that we're working on and the accreditation um, of the Black Miners Museum. So these are just our connecting um, ways to connect with us, obviously email, and I put the websites in the chat. And um, I'm just watching the time because it's 20 past and uh, any questions, reflections and comments. And this presentation today is in honour of Mr. Calvin Wallace, a former miner. Um, and sadly, I went to his funeral um, last week, um, the other week. Um, and uh, this is to, dedicated to him. who was part of this project. So I'll just uh, stop sharing uh, slides now and come back to the group. <laughs> Thank you, Norma. What Thank a fantastic you. project and went off in so many different directions with uh, with lots of great work being done. Are you able to stay around for the Q&A at the end of the day, Norma? Yes, definitely. Brilliant. So yeah. if anyone wants to put questions in the chat and then we'll speak to Norma again at the end of the day. Um, so thank you very much and for sharing those links. And I've just seen someone said that the programme is still on iPlayer. So do try Excellent. and catch that if you can. Great. So next up we have Helen Sherburn, uh, a part-time doctoral student and an accredited mediator, including with the Australian Dispute Resolution Advisory Committee. Um, so Helen is kindly speaking with us all the way from Australia today, where it's quite late in the evening. So thank you, Helen, for taking the, the time to do this. Uh, and she'll be exploring what role mediation has in resolving conflict, uh, especially relating to cultural property held in museums. So Helen, I can pass over to you. Great, thanks, Emma. Can you hear me all right? That's yeah. fine, yes. All right. Terrific, I'll share my slides in a moment. I, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we're all appearing from today, and also pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, my job is a member of the National Native Title Tribunal, and that has led me into the part-time studies in relation to museums. And the synergy there is because with the work at the Native Title Tribunal, I'm always dealing with cultural overlays and I'm dealing with Native Title um, claimants over particular areas. I'm dealing with explorers who have various um, values themselves and governments as well. So there was a parallel there when I was reading a lot about cultural property disputes in museums. Um, and so that's what led me to pursue my part-time studies um, in uh, addition to the full-time tribunal member work that I do. So today's presentation, I'm going to focus on really practical um, mediation in terms of a museum context and cultural property. So I'll touch on what museums, um, what cultural property is in a museum context uh, for the purposes of my studies and in general, what is mediation and how can it be applied to cultural property disputes? And also a little bit about safeguarding your own self-care if you're involved in disputes, because I noticed your conference themes did focus, um, uh, one of the plot points was, about self-care and that's very important when you're dealing with cultural values and um, disputes. Sometimes you can take that home with you. I won't be able to stay for question time because as Emma said, I'm presenting here and question time will be in the middle of the night. I'm presenting from Melbourne, which is on the southeast coast of Australia. So I'll just share my screen. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so if I go to my first slide for the purposes of 
looking at cultural property generally, um, I'm focusing mainly on movable artefacts rather than immovable structures or uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge or undersea property. Um, because movable objects, I guess, are the ones that uh, are most common in terms of being susceptible to that exchange, international commerce. We see a lot of that uh, commentary in the media, newspapers and books. So that's the, the focus for tonight's presentation and just generally. In terms of cultural property, you know, why is it important? Well, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime have put out this quote, which is talking about the, the testimony of cultural property, um, goes to the identity of peoples. Um, there, there are various international instruments that are going to overlay on a cultural property dispute most often, and you may even have um, state legislation, local council legislation, or country legislation that's overlaying a cultural property dispute. You'll also have your own museum policies and practices. Um, and so all of those will flavour how you as a museum curator, director or, or staff member approach a cultural property dispute. And in terms of mediation, where does mediation fit? Got a continuum here. You've got court based on one end. That's very um, win lose. Someone's going to come out with, with a win. Someone's going to come out in general terms. They can be expensive processes. They can expose the museum to additional difficulties. Uh, they can also go on for a very long time. Then somewhere in the middle, you've got arbitration. Now, my role at the Native Title Tribunal, I do mediations and arbitrations, and I can issue a binding decision on parties, uh, and they have to appeal that to the federal court. So I, I've experienced mediation and arbitration, and arbitration is a bit less win-lose than court-based. Uh, sometimes it can be a public process, sometimes it can be a private process, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Um, but it still does have that um, a little bit combative approach. Usually a tribunal issues directions, it tells parties what they have to do, parties have to provide information and commentary uh, to a certain timeline, and then a decision is made that's often binding on them. Mediation, which is the focus of the topic tonight is, and I've just put up a little snapshot there. Some of you may be familiar with mediation because you've either participated in it as, you know, perhaps the most common uh, would be family law mediation or you've had friends and family that have participated. So what you get with mediation is one or more mediators, the dispute resolution practitioners, so you can have a solo mediator or a co-mediation model, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, and those people assist two or more participants in a dispute. And what they can assist you do is identify the issues, explore those issues, then generate options for the resolution, negotiate on the options. So there may be a, a whole plethora of options that are put on the table, but some might be workable, some might not. And then the last dot point is, you don't necessarily have to reach agreement on all of the issues, even reaching agreement on some of the issues or even just one of the issues can help build trust and relationship between parties. And then that may be a dividend um, in being able to resolve some of the other issues later on down the track. And uh, what I've noticed in the conference um, over the last day and a half is people have been talking a lot about the importance of relationships um, and so I guess that's the power of mediation. So I'm not sure if the important thing to keep in mind about mediation is this here. What are the issues before you jump into generating the options? Very important. And even in our own day-to-day -day disputes that we might have 
often very tempting to come up with solutions before you've really spent is out what the issues are. And that's because people are busy, um, tired, a whole, a whole range of reasons, or it's difficult. Um, why do people... Uh, so in turn, I'll just go back. In terms of two-party mediation, it can be pretty straightforward to explore issues from two parties and generate options. Multi-party disputes, they're the kind of, you know, they're also kind of disputes that you may have as a museum. You may be involved with um, governments, indigenous communities, universities, insurers, um, the museum board, and so on. So you may have a whole lot of people at the table, at least two, three. Already, um, where the originated and uh, the museum various stakeholders in the museum and, you know, insurers, who else, curators. So you can see that spaghetti in the middle, the more parties you've got, the more complex the mediation's going to be or the more complex the dispute's going to be. I've put this up here with the wriggly arrows because typically when you've got multi-participant mediation, you're not just getting all the issues on the table and then generating options. You explore some issues, generate options, options for those, then that, of course, leads to creating a few more options. More of a lockstep and a linear process. So the um, um, the the main differences between multi-party mediation and party mediation is that coalitions can form. If you remember that slide a couple of slides ago with all that sort of mesh in the middle, you can see how easy it would be for coalitions to form between two or more parties against one. They align more. Um, and because these disputes often run over a certain period of time um, and they can be, become very entrenched if they uh, occur over years, then those coalitions may even shift over time. So you've got that second dot point, which is the importance of process management. So mediators can assist you not only keeping an eye on coalitions, um, but making sure that the mediation points in the right direction in a timely way. And then the last dot point is the kaleidoscopic nature of the party's bottom line. And by that, I mean, um, when you're looking at the dispute, the party's bottom line can change depending on that, that, those little arrows, you know, the more issues that come out, the, the more options there may be on the table. So the party's bottom line is going to change most likely over time. So the mediator will help um, participants focus on their own interests and the mediator will focus on the process, so it relieves you of that burden. Um, so what can mediation assist participants for? Pretty much whatever you need to can be um, put on the table. These are just some examples. You can look at where did the cultural property originate, if that is known, who asserts the cultural ownership, are those people going to be at the table, if so, who can represent them, um, the spiritual context of the property, what meaning does it have and to who, the environmental context, um, removing the item from its origin, when did that occur, um, you know, what does that mean, some, has some knowledge been lost in relation to that removal? Then the commercial context, and I know this is a, a big one in terms of the tribunal mediation that I do, is that often um, an explorer will come in with a very commercial focus. Some things have a dollar value, they have a, a time value, um, and just checking my time here, 
And so, you know, they come in often with that sort of value. Often the um, Indigenous community will come in with a completely different set of values. And so those values will clash. Um, the mediator can help put, you know, try and put some of those in perspective and create understandings between participants. And then that last dot point, the extent to which future generations of stakeholders should also be considered. So strategies which might assist, so I'm not sure if you've seen that bar there, um, includes pre-mediation. Now, this that pre-mediation is where um, people come in separately. So if, say, for example, if you've got four sets of participants, four groups of participants who all should be at the table, the mediator or two mediators will sit down with each set of participants, have a discussion with them, try and tease out their interests, give them some information about mediation, what is it, and make the whole thing less scary. Um, so as, as museum uh, staff and curators and directors, board members, you would be one of those sets of participants and the mediator would sit down and talk you through that and you could ask any questions you had about the process. Co-mediation is where you may have a subject matter expert and a process expert as your mediators. Um, and sometimes that can assist with cross-cultural uh, issues. You may have separate sessions along the way. Things might get heated, emotional, so you might separate parties. You might even do a shuttle from room to room or on different days if emotions are very high and the mediator, in effect, becomes um, you know, a shuttle negotiated between parties while still remaining impartial. And then that last dot point, make sure the right people are present. So that's very important. Um, the right people have to be at the table, otherwise uh, things, decisions can't be made. Um, things may be derailed some time down the track if you haven't got the right people. So that's another reason to have the pre-mediations discuss with each set of participants who do they think the right people are. Sometimes there'll be an overlap of who everyone thinks should be at the table. Sometimes even that will be a mini dispute. Um, so you'll need to attend to that. Uh, so this one says the iceberg of the dispute. So it, when, have you, how often have you walked into a room, you think you've got the facts, you've got the law, you, you know, everything's on your side, you think, but you just can't seem to get any traction with the dispute. And that's because of all these things underneath, um, emotions, different values, people's fears, there's a lot of research now in the neuroscience world that talks about the priming that people have when they're, they're even walking into a new room, an unfamiliar place, um, that, that triggers off a whole lot of um, hormones and chemicals in each of us in different ways. And so, you know, some people will come out more combative, other people will be emotional, upset, and so on. So as a mediator, you need to be aware of all that and talk your participants through through that. Um, and as museum people, just because you're going into a room thinking that the facts or the law is on your side, um, you may need to address some of these other things in order to get movement um, towards an agreement or some form of resolution. Sometimes that can be frustrating for various participants because they feel like they're wasting time um, and not really getting anywhere. And sometimes a lot of time can be spent on these things under the, uh, under the surface. In my experience, spending that time does bear dividends. And that's the mediator's role is to talk each set of participants through. There's a lot of research in, in terms of um, multi-party conflict about the use of silence and various Indigenous communities will sit quietly for a long time. Um, there's also communi communal decision-making on some Indigenous communities, which is different to 
um, organizations or, or businesses such as museums, um, you know, may have a more of a corporate approach in some circumstances. So even those things will have to be um, worked out. And once again, mediation can relieve participants of, of the burden of that. You know, they, you can focus on your interests and getting them on the table um, and the mediator handles the process part. So how to create conditions to assist resolution. Some of those things I've touched on, increase participant reduce that fear, encourage trust and rapport. Well, just simply paying attention, really listening to people, what they say, um, assisting you to get your point across. You may sort of know what, what you want to say, but you can't get it across. So all of those things, easing the logistical constraints, making sure that the, the room um, or the rooms or the venue is big enough for everyone, um, making sure there are breakout rooms in case you do need to have separate sessions, things like that. Addressing any cultural constraints, so making sure that everyone understands the culture that each participant comes from. And your museums as well will have a particular culture. Um, and so that can often assist um, if everyone has an understanding of where everyone's coming from. You may not necessarily agree, but you can understand where, where people are coming from. And then offer relevant resources. If there are very few resources, say that right up front, that helps um, rather than you know, promising something that can't be uh, made good down the track. And then how to maintain that engagement, including the necessary participants is very important. Um, and the stakeholders, and as museums, you may have many stakeholders, the public even is a stakeholder, and learn what does and doesn't work. So get that continuous feedback, feedback to the mediator, um, you know, what you're experiencing. Just checking the time here. Um, and I've talked a little bit about trying to get your interests across, and sometimes people say, well, what do you mean by that? And a is... A simple example is um, if two people have a dispute about an orange and uh, they are both, they both want the orange, that's it. So they come to the table and they say, we both want this orange and they don't take the time to dig down, okay, why do you want the orange? They end up cutting the orange in half, going away with half an orange each. But one person wanted the juice and one person wanted the rind for a cake. So by going to that next stage, having a little bit further discussion, they could have um, both got what they wanted rather than just half of, of what they wanted. And in terms of what you can do, uh, when you're involved in disputes, attention is really important only paying attention to other people paying attention to yourself this can be very engaging um, very tiring and so three quick questions that you can ask about the situation is why am I feeling it you might not know why you're feeling it, but at least asking yourself, recognising that you are having those feelings is important. And then what do I want to change? Is there anything that you can change about either your own um, reaction or perception? Do you need to gather some more information? Um, you know, what is it? Is there something about your museum that you need to change yourself personally, um, your, your group? That's something to ask yourself. And then whose problem is this? Is it other people's problem or is it your problem? Is there something that you can do about it? And then that second point in terms of being assertive, avoid those punishing 
kind of statements either against yourself or against others. Um, you know, it's no one's fault. Disputes rise up for a variety of reasons and uh, they can be messy. Um, they can develop over time. They can um, be, be so complicated and you're not even sure where they've come from sometimes. So uh, by clearly communicating to others, particularly using those I statements, being very clear, uh, if you don't understand something, just put that on the table. Um, you don't need to understand everything about what's happening. You just need to think through what do you need from the process or what do you think you need, put that on the table and then work through that. And then by participating in the dispute resolution mediation, I've seen it very successful to achieve a timely resolution. For example, some, um, just having a look here, some, in context can go on for years um, and be very expensive, whereas mediation uh, can, you know, come back with a sort of no fault. Preserve and develop relationships and create long lasting agreement. Yeah, now, I'm sorry I can't stay the questions addressed there, and by all means, an email if, if anyone has a question, I'd be happy. To. I've also Thank written you. a couple of tools uh, about. Thank you, Helen. Sorry, we had a couple of breaks in your audio there. So sorry just for cutting you off there at the end. Um, that was a really, really interesting talk. And in particular, I'd like uh, museums do need to think about, like you were saying, the cultural, spiritual, environmental and commercial context. I think that's a really interesting point to take away. Um, so thank you, Helen, for your time today. What we're going to do now, hopefully, is have a virtual tour of the National Civil War Centre, which is where we should have been uh, in, in person back in 2020. So very grateful to Glyn and uh, the team who filmed this virtual tour of the centre and its exhibitions. I'm just going to attempt to share it. Um, the audio, we don't think, is going to be amazing. So apologies in advance um, for my... Uh, poor quality computer um, but we're going to put the captions on and we'll also put the YouTube link in the chat uh, in case you want to just watch it on your own at a different uh, occasion to get better quality so uh, bear with me I'll see if this is going to work good afternoon I hope you enjoyed your lunch Welcome to the National Civil War Centre in Newark. My name's Glenn Hughes, I'm the curator here, and I'm going to be a virtual guide. Let's go inside. This is the view that will greet you when you enter the site. Uh, we have the meet and greet point, staff point on the left, and the shop in front. The museum opened in 2015 as the first National Civil War Centre. Off to the right, we go up the stairs and we have the COVID point and uh, the volunteer point. Moving steadily on from here, we get to the um, Fairfax wheelchair. Now, this is one of my favourite objects. Um, everyone recalls Oliver Cromwell. Um, no one really remembers uh, Black Tom, um, Sir Thomas Fairfax. He was commander of the newly modelled army and Cromwell's boss. During the course of the war, he had 17 wounds. He suffered from gout, the stone, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and I dare say some sort of battle fatigue as well. This wheelchair is uh, incredibly rare. There were two in the 17th century made. One was for uh, Philip of Spain, I believe. So it's a, a favourite object of mine and um, is absolutely superb. 
working as a curator at the National Civil War Centre, you get to move large pieces of ordnance. This is uh, a cannon which recently came in, which was an absolute joy to bring up the stairs. And um, I recommend you always buy your assistant a tape measure. We're now entering the main Civil War gallery. Um, it's uh, a tall room and we tried to make use of that during the interpretation with flags and standards, which was an important element of the Civil War. And we start off with the Royal Standard uh, moving progressively onwards to the uh, Standard of the Commonwealth. As you enter, there's two imposing cases. Uh, these are uh, full of armour and costume. They are uh, imposing um, and they do make a statement. They're also incredibly difficult to clean. It's also worth pointing out that the interpretation uh, has acrylic as the main headers um, to give a context and then we have printed the interpretation onto the boarding directly with images of the objects themselves. In this particular case there is the touch piece uh, which kind of reinforces that idea of the divine right of kings. The idea that kings could cure scrofula um, simply by touch. As we look along the gallery, um, you can see in the dressing up area, uh, a family trying on some armour. Always a, really nice to see a young person handing a breastplate for his father to try on. And that's kind of an active involvement. In this case, we're looking at the print revolution which occurred during the 17th century. Of course, if people could learn to read their Bible, they could also learn other literature. And this became one of the king's major problems, I think. It's also important to note that women played a key role in the printing revolution, or even though it was risky. Uh, it was one of the jobs which they could be seen to be to do. As a curator, it never fails to amaze me how creative learning and participation departments can be. And um, I think the work they've done on the, the wig with paper and um, twine is quite amazing. And there is more items here for uh, dressing up and costume, obviously for younger people, but actually the way it transpires and plays out, uh, adults do it equally as much. We provided a mirror so that they can have a look at how glorious they look. And we intentionally put in place lots and lots of interactives for uh, younger people and of course adults. We were also keen to have everyday life, um, 17th century jugs, coin hoards, leather containers, um, seal boxes, seals themselves, your 17th century version of a credit card, uh, tigs, which were three handled cups, which three individuals would drink out of. Moving forward, we see the 17th century pinup Prince Rupert, the uh, embodiment of what it was to be a cavalier. This particular case reinforces the domestic elements of the war, really, the human touch, as it were. I really like the water jug and watering can, and um, I love the way it's got those incised lines on the shoulder, which are created probably by a thumbnail. And also the, the potage cooking pot below it, which has those crimped uh, top edges, which you can almost sense the person crimping as they went around with their fingers. There's also pot of a wine glass, um, a salt dispenser, and a, a Bellamine jug, which is uh, an interesting item. Um, many of them have been found with um, pins, wax, human urine, menstrual blood, and they were to ward off curses. 
This is a, a really important case for me and it examines and looks at the medical items uh, from the Civil War, the surgeon's tools. Felt really important to us to look at and examine how soldiers were treated and looked after. Um, so in here we have a muscle knife, a bone saw, bullet extractors, a mortar and pestle for mixing powders. Um, we think that it took about a minute and a half for a good surgeon to remove a leg using a muscle knife first and then the bone saw. Um, and as with all wars, they act as catalysts. So surgery really advanced during the Civil War. Um, hospitals were set up by Parliament who realised that you had to look after soldiers. And in some respects, it's the start of the National Health Service. We also have uh, a hand brand. We have this perception that people came out for either parliamentarian or royalist, and that's how they stayed. But given the bargain of death or transferring sides, most people chose the latter. If, however, you were caught, you were branded on your hand to remind you who you were supposed to be fighting for. <laughs> so you managed to do it twice. And then we look at uh, some of the unique lozenge-shaped Newark siege pieces. Lozenge-shaped because that way there is no wastage. Um, if they were round, there would be wastage. And then we move on to um, the plague mask and hat. Um, masks are very much this season's go-to. Oh, I recommend it. We then move on to Francis Hacker's buff coat, which is a really important object for us. It embodies that uh, local story and a local man who found himself very much in the center of international and national affairs. Francis was a parliamentarian. The rest of his family were royalists. And he escorted Charles I to his execution. We do, of course, have many of the arms and armour from the war on display. Swords, hangers, rapiers, pistols, uh, lobster pots, zishaggers, and, of course, breast and black back plates. Many of the breast plates, if not all of them, have uh, proofing marks on them. These uh, were from the maker to show that the breastplate was fit for purpose. However, um, they are sometimes shortchanged the powder to make sure that the musket ball didn't go through. So they weren't 100% reliable. We also have um, small touch screens to show how the items were used during warfare. And this kind of adds a level of uh, interpretation to them and interactivity. This is the newest gallery to the museum. It's uh, the world turned upside down, conflict, chaos, and creativity. We've gone for a different look in these galleries. Uh, in the conflict and creativity gallery, there is a blue and red color scheme with uh, blood splats on the flooring, uh, the ceiling brought down with red and blue panels, which are lit. There will also be a soundscape in here at some point when COVID is finally over. We have a portrait of a very young Oliver Cromwell. In this case, we also have a pistol, uh, some books, Ward's animated versions of war, and uh, the Newark Civil War siege plan. There's a rather sweet claret bottle there, which I, I very much like, and a Samuel Cooper miniature of Oliver Cromwell. The sword and gauntlet are amazing objects attributable to Lord Fairfax, who we've met before. The sword is amazing. It shows all the nicks and cuts uh, are being used and been in battle. 
What I find equally interesting is the Scold's Bridal, which uh, during the 17th century, a, a lady called Dorothy War, a Quaker, went into Carlisle to preach. Um, and she recollected of what it was like to have a Scold's Bridal put on her um, for basically putting forward the word of God. And I think Dorothy is one of those people who isn't really known in history. And the Skull's Bridal is, is a way for us to engage with her and to tell that story. And I think it's, it's an amazing story. In the Creativity Gallery, we were displaying four books in the center of the room. Books are pretty challenging at the best of times to display. And um, we wanted to go for something like that resembled a print explosion and how the ideas in the books went out into the world and shaped and changed them. In the case, we've got a Stuart glass, which has a Stuart rose on it and a butterfly, which denotes the king over the water, Bonnie Prince Charlie. In the center, there's a wonderful piece of English pewter released as a commemorative item, one of the first, I believe, to celebrate Catherine of Braganza's wedding to Charles II. One of the most important books we have in the collection is Icon Basilica. This particular copy was owned by Charles II and is from his library. This book, I think, is responsible for the deification of Charles I, um, the fact that we still have Charles the Martyr Day in January. It depicts him at prayer prior to his execution. On the floor is his earthly crown. A crown of thorns is in his hand and his heavenly crown awaits him. In the background, we have stormy seas. And we also have the Latin saying basically with great responsibility comes great weight. Icon went through something like 52 different editions in its first year. It was so problematic to Parliament that they commissioned John Milton to write a argument against it, which was Iconoclastes, which is also in the gallery. Moving out of the galleries, we turn right up the stairs. As I mentioned before, we have the animals from the world turned upside down, woodcut, and various phrases which we felt were appropriate for creativity. At the top of the stairs, we reach the two temporary galleries. At the moment, we have one called Fake News. We utilised a red bus to put quotes on, really, from the 17th century, but also up to modern day. It seems a well-used medium for messaging nowadays. And we looked at, as we went through the gallery of different means of disseminating information. So from First World War letters, 17th century letters, through to how images were perceived and dealt with. So daguerreotypes, photographs, cameras, and then on to typewriters, telephones, radios, and televisions up to uh, Casio radio, a very small one, uh, a rather large laptop, allegedly. I've carried it, I don't recommend that. And um, a Huawei mobile phone. So what we're looking at really is how, with modern media, we are our own editors. Um, and that has its pros and it has many cons. And it never felt more relevant really and it's, it's been a popular exhibition. It's also given us the opportunity to get some of the reserve collection out 
that people can actually touch. We have a over 90,000 objects in the collections and there's innumerable typewriters, telephones, radios, and televisions, and, and even a switchboard. So we've been able to get those out and allow people to interact with them, which is great, really. In the second gallery, we have a Create Your Own Headline Interactive, along with, shall we say, fake objects that are accorded the same security, casing, etc., as normal museum objects. To look at that kind of element of museum curators also have a truth um, and to question everything. In the centre of the room, there is a feedback wall. Uh, we'll come back to that. That's quite interesting what people will say, as I'm sure you all know. And at the end wall, we look at um, a portrait of Charles I by Anthony van Dyck, looking incredibly regal, an oak tree in the background to denote strength in the, very, the far background, there is a green and pleasant land. His hand is on a globe uh, and he has a martial baton and his fingers on a sword. It's all done for effect. Nothing is left to chance in the portrait. Similarly, we have the portrait of Oliver Cromwell by Sir Peter Lilly and paint me warts and all very different attitude towards how you should be presented. We put the feedback wall in the centre of the room uh, and encourage people to pick up cards, write their thoughts on them and then add them to the various display panels. It's proved very, very successful, really popular. Um, some of the things that have been written on there are challenging, funny, uh, and interesting. And, and I think that's, that's great. But it's a, it's a great way of obviously learning what people think and what people think is fake news. I thought it would be nice to show you the back of the building. This is the original Tudor building, which the Georgians rather helpfully built in front of. It's a space which is used for weddings, uh, various talks and tours and things like that come out here. It's quite a nice area to sit uh, and uh, eat your lunch. Um, it's also used for what appears to be Kung Fu practice, um, which was surprising. And um, we have herbs and medical plants as well. This is the learning and participation block. Um, this is where our learning and participation team bring history to life. Um, and they're amazing at it. They have a fantastic imagination and incredibly creative and they have the ability to stimulate and inspire young people. And it's brilliant. And they've attracted children uh, from as wide a field as Hampshire up to Liverpool. And um, it's a, an area of creativity. And it's wonderful to be in the room when they are really inspiring kids. It's fitted out, purpose-built, it has a sink and obviously toilets, it has lots of storage space, although not enough, for various props and things, and uh, but tables and chairs, but it also has mini cannons and muskets and pikes, uh, and that's a risk assessment and a half, there, right there. We've also put in place some of the objects from the collections into cases just to inspire and to hopefully help the team translate the period really 
and we have the obligatory arm which needs operating on and is tapping into the golf vest that we have and um, I get uh, people in the street, window cleaners, stopping me and talking to me about this arm and how little Jimmy loves it and thinks it's fantastic. So um, it's great to have it here, I guess. Um, it's a wonderful thing. And the interactive maker even managed to put in hairs to make it authentic. And you can see the bones well exposed. So this is where the magic happened, really. Not yet now. Hot up a pine custard. Thanks, Glyn, and the team for that virtual tour. And that's very mean teasing us with cake at the end when we're not there in person. However, I appreciate we are running a little bit late, but I think it's important that we do still have a break. Um, so go and have a cup of tea and maybe some cake, although not as delicious as that one there. And if we could reconvene at 12.25 for our next workshop, which is going to be from uh, Mumadi and Rian Rosen. Uh, and they've asked us if you have any sugar to hand, if you could please bring a little bit of sugar with you to the workshop uh, and it will all make sense. So reconvene here in just over 10 minutes at 12.25. Thanks everyone. So this is our final session of the morning and one I'm really excited about, um, which is we have Mamadi, who's a student of agriculture, horticulture, and a lived practice in East and West Africa, and Rian Rosen, a natural history curator at Bristol Museums. And together they're going to run a workshop for us addressing difficult difficult histories and interpreting colonial narrative consciously and ethically, specifically relating to mid 18th century Jamaica. So a reminder, if you have some sugar to hand, I have some here, I'm excited about. Um, uh, the workshop will incorporate some questions. So if you want to um, pop the questions in the chat as they occur to you, and then um, our speakers will answer them at the end of the workshop. So in about maybe uh, half an hour, 40 minutes time or so. Um, and so I will hand over now to Mamadi and Rian. Hello everyone. I'm not gonna say much as the video will present the information. It's no longer a workshop as such as originally it would have been in person. However, there will be a few questions asked in the chat for you to respond to. I would like to thank Mama D and co for taking me on this journey and for interrogating the collection from a Jamaican perspective. I've yet to see the final version myself. I have much learning still to do on this, as well as unlearning too, which is essential. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Rianne. Thank you, everybody, um, for some amazing presentations, both yesterday and, and today. Um, I want to quickly say before we start the video that I believe that both inside and outside of museums, that we are always curating stories. I think it's our nature as humans to do so, both to for, for various reasons, to make sense of our lives, to tame fear, to build relationships, and to avoid shame and embarrassment. I want to touch on the matter of trauma, which I believe is an embedded experience of having fear, shame, guilt, and stress stuck within us, which is present in all of us to some degree, but it may become more apparent whenever we're activated or stimulated or the word that is most commonly used is triggered. So wanting us to think about whilst we watch this video, how can museums be more mindful of a collective responsibility to manage this trauma whilst at the same time promoting learning from objects that relate to our lived experience around the whole world that has been collected from, especially now that the whole world is our neighbour. We live in a very plural society. 
So we're going to ex we explore particular collections um, held at Bristol Museum of three characters um, with this in mind. And we're asking you to keep the sugar actually in the palm of your hand throughout this video. And we will reflect on how that experience of just holding the sugar and relating how you feel about this sugar in the palm of your hand whilst you're watching um, and experiencing this video. So I'm going to now attempt to share my screen successfully. <laughs> Got it all sorted. share a unique experimental workshop which addresses controversial items in this Bristol Museum collection with some overspill into others. The Reverend John Lindsay's unpublished Elegancies of Jamaica, Robert Long's Musing and Paintings and Arthur Broughton's Herbarium Collection all carry a style supportive of colonialism platocracy in Jamaica. This includes their view of forms of nourishment healthcare and culture that originate in both an enlightenment and culturally entitled disposition. Our workshop interrogates both the form and content of their presentation by drawing on experts of their text and any embedded inaccuracies, demonstrating some of the inherent biases towards economic, cultural and political interests of the white plantocracy. We highlight different processes of displacement of alternative contemporary narrative, using a lively theatrical form to engage with each other and audience, we hope to provoke engagement across conference themes. Reverend Lindsay, born in 1729, died in 1788, and Robert Long, the latter, the brother of the infamous Edward Long, were able to benefit from their position as planter class elite by having much free time to access local knowledge and to voyeuristically access intimate details of the lives of those enslaved. However, that they were unable to do so with accuracy relates to their inherent prejudices and wrong-headedness about the nature of the human. If one was not white and of an elite class in this era, one was automatically inferior in all the ways in which the human was understood to be. The objectified human was understood to have had no view of what was a highly objectified nature, human or non-human, including its own self. We ask the critically important question, in what ways does the curation of items within museum collections perpetuate this objectification? Within the domain of today's natural history, to enable Jamaican histories recorded by non-Jamaicans to be interrogated from a contemporary Jamaican perspective is relatively novel. Why does this continue to be the case? We trust that this will open the possibility for other such archives to be subject to further pluralistic interpretations of histories. We encourage communities which are currently disconnected from these collections to critically explore their pasts and relate these to their present natural and social environmental challenges. Such insights and perspectives are, especially in the current era, we propose very valuable and very relevant. 
There are some other questions. For example, are plants and animals there for the enumerating and collecting or for us as humans to be in relationship with as sibling life forms upon a shared earth? In what way does a monocultural perspective on items from places and situations ac across a cultural and political abyss afford us the necessarily diverse worldview to be able to co-steward the earth? in any way that is truly meaningful and sustainable. And lastly, how can we transform the notion of collection itself so that it responds to the underlying causes of why it may have originated in the first place? This may arise from a notion that as humans, we are destined to obliterate our present and future because we do not understand that other forms of life have autonomy or sovereignty, starting with the otherized humans, which are very acts of collecting places in abjection. We inspect the teeth. This as grief. Can you can you dance? Can you twirl? But I'm just a girl. Stand steady there. Let's see. Hmm. Are you fit to breathe? Oh no, Bokka, I'm a child. There's no need. <laughs> Next a lot. Bring them on, bring them on. Next a lot. Merchandise or slave. I am not. The auction block might be likened to the marketplaces of today where products are bought and sold and sold again and again after being processed. The average age of the African being sold was 14 years old. This means that there were many who were much younger and many much older, but not that old, as being past childbearing age was felt to be as useless as being economically unproductive is currently considered. A seasoned, enslaved African and we must call no human a slave, might be worthy of a higher price because of the level of investment that had gone into his or her training. Training. <laughs> training of how to prepare certain Western dishes, how to sew her mistress's clothes, how to manage the master's household staff. All ways of being not useful for the enslaved African's own survival or economy, such that it was. But then, how useful is curing the pork to the pig? Is the trained bear better able to survive than his untamed counterpart? And why should any likeness be made to animals but the word chattel, as in chattel slavery, derives from cattle. As so it was, the African bought and sold, often repeatedly. It is how he was regarded. Arthur Broughton was born in Bristol in 1758, son of Reverend Thomas Broughton and Anne Harris. He trained first as an apothecary locally in Bristol and then undertook further medical studies in Edinburgh, 
He worked as a physician at the Bristol Infirmary in 1780, up to the middle of 1783 when he became ill, likely as a result of a local respiratory epidemic or perhaps asthma. A sea voyage was prescribed and undertaken, and he seemed to have fully recovered once in Jamaica in 1784. He gained employment as a physician to the plantocracy, but he had much leisure time to pursue botanical studies, and so he did so, collecting and collating and then producing published volumes of work. One was published in 1792 and another in 1794. Methinks I am not myself, for such that I see is though a dream or a nightmare, and I am gripped with a fever that may cause me once again to experience the epidemic I once ran from. Could it be this pandemic of which I see warnings everywhere called Covid? Has it become so dangerous a plague that it remained for so long, though at first for me the remedy was to take of more wine, but I found at my cost that it was not a cure. Mimosa, haha, <laughs> wonderful, what an excellent example of tarot. But there is no breadfruit to be found here. Not surprising, for they were in as sorry a state as I was when departing their native lands. <coughs> Ye gods, can it be that a negress has found her way as well over to the present day? I would have thought that your kind would have all died out. Such were your degraded conditions and the filth in which you lived. Filth? Is filth, you say? Dotty is who dotty make. Is you and your kind put us in the kind of filth we did have to live in? If it wasn't for the goodness of this earth, we wouldn't survive. I know you named doctor. You as a doctor supposed to treat all of us. But it's only some of us who treat and leave the rest of us to just die. You say it's the good ear that make you better, but it's our food and our life and living that make you better. You know what keep us alive? Is that taro leaf and the root cassava that the native people taught us. What to rubbish eat. is this? You rubbish! Talk. The rubbish that you leave us to eat. We couldn't survive with that. We're lucky. We have a few native teach we how to eat cassava and make cocoa tea. And we can eat the leaf of taro and cocoa yam. that I keep we alive. Twas such a shock to be transported thus to this, this, this other Bristol. Uh, uh, oh, 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 my. <coughs> I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm done. Your herbs can do me no good now. They have no potency for me. <coughs> <laughs> he 
he chose not to return to Bristol and remained in Jamaica until his death in 1796. Robert Long has been known as the observer. There is a saying that goes, we see things not as they are, but as we are. His commentary is what we might expect from a 22 year old who thinks very highly of himself. Why is it that we still keep what he has to say as a set of valuable records that are meaningful and of value and which can convey any truth? What is it that we still hold deep within ourselves which acts as adhesive and keeps collections such as this sticking around? Robert's paintings have little been referenced Yet even more silent in the archives are the lives he described. The lives of their wives and daughters, the Africans and their descendants, the plant and animal life of Jamaica, all of whom his brother enumerated and vilified in many ways, debasing all so as to ensure their places in perpetual servitude to industrialization and the growth economy, and the accompanying degradation of the global environment. The scene is here to explore the contrasting potential conversation using inanimate objects, which nevertheless had lives which connect to the histories of Jamaica as told by very different subjects. The space is within the art galleries of the Bristol Museum, which hold both silverware, glassware and china household items which relate to that era and beyond it. We have here some of my family's household items. We ate out of them, displayed them and had our Negroes polish and cherish them. They have kept up a legacy of being cherished and valued. They have lasted until now and become even more valuable. A heritage indeed. We had to make sure that the household of Negroes did not mishandle these heirlooms. Anyone caught breaking or otherwise damaging any of these items would be immediately and severely punished, usually by whipping or any other invented punishment we felt appropriate. To ensure that our household Negroes were kept as well disciplined as those in the field. What we eat out of would never be on display here. Our utensils made from coconut, calabash, clear and gourds. So most of them have perished. So no display for cabinet and no story to tell about how we did eat. So we understand that although our ancestors can do all of these things in the kitchen, there is no relationship made in the display cabinets between these items and our ancestors. No talk of the punishment involved in making sure nothing was broken of carrying heavy silver or pewter and maintaining the shine. No mention of the toll it took to ensure tens of people were fed on a regular basis and with care to avoid simple sicknesses that could easily arise in a tropical situation where there were no modern techniques of preservation. We had to entertain so many guests. There were many visitors and it was a fine way to pass the time. So of course, our wives and mothers had to teach our family Negroes how to cook, especially when they were having to handle our fine imported foodstuffs and to prepare our special recipes. You know, the fruit possets mother would love and were gentle on her stomach. 
When we had guests, it was like Christmas all over again. We had to get the most able of them to sew new clothes so they would be neat enough to serve us at the table and not be enticing our men with their raggedy clothes or garments soaked with perspiration. We had was to stand upon my foot all day and all of the evening and yet be ready for them call we throughout the night for any purpose. No mind how small or how much we no one got to them or how we tire all of this with the threat of whipping if any little thing no right. And we wash everything we self, we cloth, all of them clothing and house and things were inside the house and then turn round wash them too. It wasn't easy at all. Then we did have to fix so many different food kind using the knowledge handed down and what we learned since we come from Africa. And when all of this is displayed, all we get is a simple one dimensional story of how the rich lived, ate and made merry. We have no idea of the larger system of pain and suffering which maintained this lifestyle at the time and also enabled these items to be preserved so that we can see them now and learn, albeit in a limited way, about them. Who really paid the cost of these displays? Castor. Sugar was supplied in large cones which had to be broken up and then ground with a pestle and mortar to produce fine castor sugar. Tea canister. The pull-off cap served as a measure instead of a spoon. What? Hot chocolate to a time to Go and feed my child. Now, please. Seventeen twenty five, sixth of March. My mother at Bath for her hands cure. 1726. Drought at Old Harbour. 1731. June 17. Sir Nicholas Laws died after a long and painful illness and was buried at Halfway Tree Church. 1731. Drought in Clarendon. 1751. September 14th. James Dawkins died. 1753, September 6th, George Ellis Esquire died in Spa Town. 1774, Lindsay after emerging from the painting into the art gallery, is coughing <coughs> and rubbing his upper body as if cold and also for comfort. He looks around at everything unusual and stands almost as if glued to the spot. Eventually, he gathers himself together. Could you inform me of where I am? What is this, this gallery? Who is your, who's the owner of this place? And why are you so peculiarly dressed? But the curator gathers up her senses, being quite visibly shocked and afraid, having witnessed the entry of Lindsay into the room. She manages to intercept him and asks him to follow her and leads him towards a locked door through which she gestures that he follows. She leads him via a rather circuitous route to a rather sparse passageway that will lead to a library. How oh, the quality of artwork has become poorer and more shabby, and not as I recall, and that the decor is not being maintained very well. You might be 
better placed in the rear of our, our little jaunt around this place so as not to expose to a refined gentleman scholar your <coughs> undecoratedly short petticoat behind me because I cannot really be expected to manage such a circumstance. At the point that this is said, they are beginning to ascend a particularly undecorated stairway. Lindsay, distracted by its appearance, blurts out, Where are we going? These passageways are for the slaves, for the Negroes. I'm too well born for this. Take me back! Take me back! No, I'm here. He notices wow. a bookshelf and the grills on the windows and comments on both. What is this? The black and more sense of reading now? What kind of master is this who offers learning to the caged chattel of the field and house? A tragedy! What a travesty! What traitorship! He is clearly both angry and confused, and after peering at the books on several shelves, so moves on in this manner, mumbling to himself and gesticulating at the books. After a further flight of stairs, they come to a locked door and enter into what appears to be a library. Uh, yes, yes. I shall wait here for your master. Tolerable place. Access to some literature. Yes, perhaps this is the one. Uh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Sir, would you like to see your work? Well, yes, of course, of course! You're down in the basement. Well, let's go with no delay! And they exit the room and make their way swiftly to where they are kept. Just then, other curators walk past, totally ignoring him. And one says... I'll be passing your collections off shortly. Okay, see you later. Okay. To which the curator agrees, and this allows her to move on with Lindsay. Once in the space where the elegances volumes are kept, Lindsay explains. But look at the state it brought and was supposed to have taken the utmost care. You must have carried it aboard some hideous slaver or clipper. This was bound directly for Q or Physic Garden under the care of Joseph Banks himself. As he is handling the sheets carefully, poring over the images and muttering, one of the curator's colleagues, who they had met earlier, come into the space. They are clearly eager to pass on a message. They've announced that we're going to have a makeover. And this collection's headed for the bin. Um, it's not relevant to a decolonising museum, one that wants to be pro-climate care. They want to get rid of it all and produce, put materials in which appeal to a much wider diversity of people. He heads over to the large tome that Lindsay is engaged in and tries to take it up. Lindsay Shocked, refuses to let it go. The second curator seems puzzled as to why the book is so heavy to lift. Gives up. Hey ho, it's going to be quite a bit of work to get rid of this of old rubbish. The outrage, the scandal, my works, Robert's fine paintings, Broughton's taxonomy, all to be thrown away. I shall not allow it. I, my work, my learning, it's all too fragile. Unknown to Lindsay, though, as he is speaking, he is beginning to fade out. You're right. It's certainly a joke. I don't think they'll get rid of all of it. They wouldn't burn it. And then there is silence, the whole scene in stillness. Anyone? Is she dead? She's dead. She's dead! She's dead! Sugar. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
King Sugar who laughs <laughs> and laughs <laughs> and laughs, <laughs> who laughs at us all as he has us enthralled by his generous hand which gives even as he takes away all our lives. <laughs> So, thank you. I hope you were able to um, watch all of that. And um, I might take a like to take a moment to consider, to reflect, and to have a look at those questions in the chat. And uh, yeah, how you might think about answering them. Um, yeah, I'd love to see uh, people's faces if it's possible for people to um, share their videos and just generally engage if we can change the format of view so we can see each other's faces, um, then yeah, please share your feelings, your perspectives, your responses. Thank you both. That was a really, um, yeah, a really incredible experience and something a bit different for our conference. So the questions, as, as Mama Dee says, are in the chat. I'll just read them out again. So question one. In what ways does the curation of items within museum collections perpetuate the objectification of inferiorized human and non-human beings? Question two. How can we encourage different relationships between collectors and the collected from to support current social, cultural and environmental transformation where there are challenges today? And then question three, how can we present and curate items in our exhibitions and galleries so as to enable them to speak more to the public directly about a wider range of histories than they do currently? Don't know if anyone wants to use the, the raise hand function and then we can come to you. But please share your thoughts however you would like. Whilst you're having a, a think and a reflection, um, I wanted to share a quote with you from somebody whose book you might like to try to access, um, Resma Menachem, uh, an American author, um, psychotherapist and, and trained in, in various counseling services. He has this saying, which I've been sharing actually recently in a number of spaces. And the saying is when culture meets strategy, culture trumps strategy every time. 
And what he's saying is speaking to the, the way that rational and linear thinking becomes inferior to the ways in which we actually learn and hold in our own bodies our emotional and psychological responses to things, you know, that can trigger us. So that what he's saying in effect is that if we're seeking uh, in this context, if we're seeking to curate in a way that promotes learning and transformation, that we're going to have to understand how we can work both with the idea of culture and how it interfaces with the uh, collections and exhibitions and the somatic by which I mean everything, our psychology and our emotions that are held and displayed in our stress responses. You know, those stress from stress responses, which say, let's run from this as fast as we can. Let's not engage with it, you know, or we fight it. We, we become resistant to it and we come up with very intellectual arguments as to why things need to stay the same or we freeze. We can't respond at all. These are traumatic stuck responses and we, we, we have to engage with them if we really want things to change, if we want behaviour change, if we want the curation of stories that we're, we're doing to actually move everybody who engages with these stories on in some way. So one thought I had, which I did put in the chat, was I think we need as museum professionals to move away from seeing objects as purely aesthetic. So looking at them as, as decorative objects and realizing as your film really highlights, you know, the, the human and non-human produce and work that has gone into creating them and the impact that that, that has. We've got some comments coming through on the chat, which I hope people won't mind if I uh, read out. So from Kitty Ross, I found that the use of drama was very powerful as a way to bring the issues out, things that are difficult to express just through labels and written interpretation. So again, maybe we need to consider other methods of uh, interpreting our collections. From Evelyn, if the full story is not told, the story inferiorized will be forgotten and their being is made unimportant. But if the story is full with all possible involved are named, they are not forgotten. Yeah, I see that there's a question there. And from Lydia. Can... Sorry. <laughs> now go on. Um how using a Jamaican accent was considered when filming this was it easy to keep the authenticity <laughs> we had lots of uh, laughter and <laughs> there are lots of outtakes we could show you <laughs> um, in terms of all the accents in fact um, and there's a lot more footage that we were just not able <laughs> to, to put together in a short enough um, film but I thought it was very rich to have the different accents um, in it to try to um, bring about even in the actors a sense of oh my goodness how does this actually feel in the, you know in the moment in, in, in what we were were doing um, so accents um, the dress itself brought a whole other level of experience in in our interactions and believe you me we had long conversations um, all the time around <laughs> around this, uh, you know, putting the, I'm sure Rian, you might like to say some of your own experience. Oh, I'm off mute. I thought I was on mute. Yeah, it was an incredible experience and I learned so much. Um, and you did see a behavioral change when costumes were put on. Um, and I guess, yeah. But I was thinking of the questions myself that you proposed. And 
I recognize that with, we recognize that with our Extinction Voices exhibition that we had, where we put black veils over the animals, um, we were narrow, narrowly thinking or looking at ecological crisis from an European way. Um, and through doing that, we possibly accidentally perpetuated issues of global harm. And from that, we're now addressing that by trying to get funds in order to put the global voices and to um, look at the emotion, interest, concerns and feelings and beliefs from all around the world regarding those animals. So they're fantastic questions that we, we should have had before we did the exhibition. Thank you. Thanks, Rian. And I think we can all consider, you know, keep considering those questions as we go through uh, the day and hear some of our, our other speakers as well. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Mama D and Rian for all the work they've put into creating that video and in making an experience for us when we couldn't be there uh, in person. So thank you for that. Uh, and we're now going to go on our lunch break. Um, we've overrun slightly due to, to various things. Um, so we're just going to catch up our time in our lunch, if that's all right. So we will restart at the advertised time at 2 p.m. So uh, go and have a good break. Consider thinking about those questions. And we look forward to seeing you at two o'clock.